In the early hours, Europe's largest nuclear power plant faces shelling. As Russian forces attempted to capture the energy-producing city of Enerhoda, officials at the Zaporizhka plant say the assault caused a fire. Live footage showed the incoming shelling. On another angle, too, from a CCTV camera, the shells can be seen flaring in the sky and then landing on the site. Amid the alarm, an urgent appeal from the Ukrainian president. Europe has to wake up now. Europe's largest nuclear power plant is on fire. At this very moment, Russian tanks are shooting at nuclear reactor blocks. These are tanks equipped with thermal vision devices, so they know where they're shooting. They were prepared for this. Zelensky also spoke directly to Joe Biden and Boris Johnson. Despite the panic, by 6 a.m. local time, the fire reportedly in a training building had been extinguished. The International Atomic Energy Agency says it hasn't affected essential equipment and Ukraine's regulator reports no change in radiation levels. Ukrainian authorities say Russian forces have now taken control. But Russia says the nuclear plant has been under their control since Monday and that it was attacked by a Ukrainian sabotage group in a monstrous provocation. NATO foreign ministers in Brussels today are furious. Well, this was a completely reckless act. We've heard now that the fire has been extinguished, but it is extremely concerning that forces are prepared to do this. We've called for an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council. This is a threat to European security and stability, and we need those responsible to be held to account. And yet Vladimir Putin believes his special operation in Ukraine is going according to plan. Sit down, please. So says President Macron, who spoke to the Russian leader by phone, having met in person in early February. What? With no end to the war in sight, this group of friends in Lviv have decided they need to learn military skills to fight Russian forces. An injured former Ukrainian soldier teaches them how to handle weapons. It's better to shoot from a lying down position because it will be easier. This welder is making metal barriers to be used as roadblocks to try and stop incoming soldiers. The youngest here is 16. The eldest is 68, and it turns out that the people who are older, they have understood there's no place to run. The worst thing that could happen has already happened. The war is already at our door. Every night they leave the Finnish barriers outside the scrapyard for anyone to take, defiant and determined to stop Russian troops. Fatima Manju reporting. Well, in an act of defiance, 300 members of the Ukrainian parliament who secretly met yesterday in Kyiv sang the national anthem together in the parliament amid the ongoing shelling by Russian troops. <laughs> Well, the MP you saw there was Yaroslav Zelezniak, and he joins me now. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I know you don't want to tell us exactly where you are, but can you tell us what the situation is there at the moment? Um, hello. I'm now in Kiev Oblast. As you know, it is one of the most active uh, districts now in Ukraine where Russian soldiers are trying to occupy and block Kiev. Now the uh, lack of uh, petroleum and the power, so they are stuck in uh, near the north of the Kiev, and I hope they will not receive uh, and make forward their actions. But now I'm trying to help with humanitarian aid to Kiev and Kiev Oblast. Uh, yesterday, as you saw, we 300 MPs, it is uh, the constitutional majority in Ukrainian parliament, gathered. gathered in the building of Ukrainian parliament, known in, not in some hiding place, not exactly in the building of Ukrainian parliament, and voted at, uh, approximately 12 uh, draft laws, which uh, was needed for uh, war time. We also voted uh, our request to all international uh, international organization all countries which now support ukraine with uh, a request for to close sky uh, above the ukraine 
to create no fly zone because you see the Russians are now trying to buy their missile, destroy our towns, destroy our infrastructure. And unfortunately, as we saw today night, they tried to also destroy nuclear uh, power stations. And it, it is not the only risk now for Ukraine. In, it's also the risk for all Europe and the whole world. Because once again, the Zaporozhye nuclear station is six times more uh, risk is than uh, Chernobyl station. Yeah, well, and just just on that blow. point, I mean, as you say, an extraordinary act of defiance by the MPs yesterday. But I wonder how long that defiance can last in the face of some really alarming developments, not least this attack on the nuclear power plant last night. I mean, that must spread real alarm among Ukrainians. Yes, and unfortunately, it, it could be uh, long. And we understand that uh, we are smaller army with, uh, comparing with Russia, a big country, and uh, a lot of soldiers. But, you know, we are protecting our land. And uh, yesterday and uh, days before that, I was in, in Kyiv. And if you are in Kyiv, you understand that it is in, impossible to any country to occupy and uh, to take power inside Kyiv. They could blow block around Kyiv, but if you are going as a Russian soldier inside Kyiv, you will be killed because there is a lot of weapons uh, on the street. There is a lot of cocktail molotovs on the street, and the people of Ukraine. We have two uh, revolutions and democracy for democ but democracy and the European Union um, choice. So it is impossible to get inside Kyiv. But but what are you hearing from Mariupol and Odessa? Because we are hearing very bleak reports. From those places. Look, I'm I I am born in Mariupol, I, uh, and I'm from Mariupol. It is where for our um, understanding, it is one of the most eastern uh, city in Ukraine. It's six thousand, uh, six six hundred thousand uh, populations. My sister now in in Mariupol, and I have not any connection with uh, her husband or herself. Uh, at least the last three days. I know that they are sitting without electricity. I know that they are sitting without any uh, supply of food. And uh, even though there is, I'm not sure that any other communal services are provided now. Uh, I just spoke with my uh, cousin and he has neighbors which could see the house of uh, our, my sister and they say that now it's okay. It's not under a missile attack. Mm -hmm. But once again, it's a very uh, bad situation as well as in Kharkiv. I just want to ask you very, very quickly, sir. Um, NATO foreign ministers are meeting today. Ukraine have made it very clear what they want from NATO. NATO have made it very clear there is no question there will be no fly zone. Is there anything else they can offer you right now? Um, look, we need, what we need from all countries, all international organizations, first of all, no fly zone. Second is providing more weapons. Because, uh, you know, in Ukraine, you, we have the army and as well, we have so-called territory security. It is just civilians who gather in groups and pro, uh, protect their own cities. There is checkpoints, they connect it with army. So it is, look, it is like second army of Ukraine. And now they asking just uh, hamlets, the bulletproof clothes and uh, weapons. Yaroslav Bullets... Uh, I'm sorry to cut across and, you there. Yaroslav uh, Zelezniak, we it. have to finish there. But thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Well, here the government has called for a special meeting of the UN Security Council. Our political correspondent, Liz Bates, is in Westminster. Liz, what can you tell us? Yes, well, as that situation was developing overnight with the nuclear power plant, what we know is that there was a, a phone call between President Zelensky and Boris Johnson. Um, and in that phone call, the Prime Minister told the Ukrainian President, uh, first of all, the reckless actions of President Putin could now threaten the security of all of Europe. He also said to him that he would now seek that meeting, as you said, an emergency meeting of the, of the uh, UN Security Council in the coming hours. Um, Elsewhere, the Foreign Secretary, uh, Liz Truss, is in Brussels. She'll be in meetings today uh, of NATO, of G7 foreign ministers, and also there will be a meeting of the EU's Foreign Affairs Council. Now, the government here has been under pressure over sanctions, um, critics saying that they need to go much further. That is an issue that she has said that she will be raising with allies today. Uh, we've been very coordinated in sanctions. We've shown huge unity. It's having a big effect in Russia, but we now need to do more. 
We particularly need to look at the oil and gas sector. How do we reduce our dependence across Europe on Russian gas? How do we cut off the funding to Vladimir Putin's war machine? That's what I'm going to be advocating at both the G7 and the discussions with the EU. Yes, yeah, so that comes after some criticism uh, here of the UK sanctions regi regime, including from some Conservative MPs, and in particular the targeting of individuals, the seizing uh, of assets here in the UK. What critics say is that that process has been too slow and that it just simply hasn't been uh, transparent enough. So that is one area uh, where, where we could expect to see some movement in the coming days. Liz, thanks very much. Now, the head of the UN's nuclear watchdog says he's willing to travel to the Chernobyl site to negotiate with Russia and Ukraine with the aim of ensuring the safety and integrity of nuclear sites during the conflict, calling the situation extremely tense and challenging. Well, joining me now is Dr Patricia Lewis, who's director of the International Security Programme at Chatham House. Dr Lewis, thanks very much for speaking to us today. I mean, how alarmed should we be? Um, well, this is a, a very big change in the conflict, uh, a direct attack on a nuclear facility that's actually active, as opposed to Chernobyl, which was a, a storage facility um, post the disaster in the 80s. So it, it's an, a, a, a big issue. And I think that the IAEA, that's normally so cautious and so careful with all of its member states, including Russia, and that made a statement that was agreed by all countries uh, um, a few years ago, back in 2009, that there should be no attacks on nuclear facilities, civil nuclear facilities, has come out very strongly here, calling it a Russian projectile, as that's really quite a big step. And also, I think, um, the Director General, uh, Rafael Grossi, offering to go uh, to uh, Ukraine, specifically to Chernobyl, to talk about uh, how to stop this, how to protect the sites and, and um, make sure that not only Ukraine, but the rest of Europe is safe from a radioactive incident. And that, and that is evidence of how serious this is, isn't it? This offer to go and essentially try and broker some sort of negotiation between the two sides. Exactly. I mean, it's it's a really um, an amazing thing. He's, he has to go to Tehran now to the Iran nuclear talks. That that has to happen. It's, there's a critical moment, and then he's offering to go to to Ukraine and put himself forward before any inspectors come. So he's almost saying, you know, dare, I dare you to attack me. I mean, it, it's it's really a big step for the the leader of a, an international agency like the IAEA. But I think that um, if we look at what's actually going on, there is no radioactive release. But there are some real dangers at that site and at the other sites in, in Ukraine. Um, in that you have the, um, the, the reactors that are on site, there are six on this particular site, and then you have spent fuel, which is the leftover fuel that goes into big cooling ponds and stays there for a long time. It's, they're very radioactive, they're very dirty radioactivity, lots of very nasty, dangerous isotopes. And they're covered by a concrete shelter to uh, withstand an airplane crash, but would they withstand a missile attack? I think this is one of the big worries that the nuclear community has at the moment. And of course, as you say, it is very different from Chernobyl, but, but that ghost hangs over everything, doesn't it? That ghost, and also Fukushima. So one of the things we learned from Fukushima is how important it is to have external power to nuclear reactors. If the external power supply were to be attacked or accidentally caught in, a, in, a, in an attack, then we would find ourselves in a very dangerous situation, very similar perhaps to Fukushima, in one of the areas where there are active reactors. There's one active now at this particular site. Um, so, you know, it, 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 there's such dangerous areas to be attacking that we really do need to have some protective capability there, which the IAEA is trying to do. Dr Patricia Lewis, thank you very much for talking to us today.